When Seto awoke, it was so dark that he could scarcely distinguish his surroundings. He looked at his alarm clock, and to his great astonishment, the device declared it to be twelve. Twelve? Unlikely! It had been past two when he went to bed, and it wasn't possible that he'd slept through a whole day and into the next night, nor was it possible that anything had happened to the sun making it dark at noon. The only reasonable conclusion was that the blasted thing was broken, but as he reached for his phone, which was tuned into a Kybercorp satellite, and blinked through the blinding light, he saw that this was not the case. Seto sat on his bed and thought and thought, and the more he thought, the less he could make of it. He had no choice but to conclude that the whole ordeal had been some kind of dream, although for reasons he could not, or would not, identify, he had a hard time believing it. Then again, there was a way to know for sure. He eyed the clock suspiciously. A quarter past, half past, a quarter to. Seto found himself confronted by an unearthly visitor, an ethereal being with perfectly quaffed hair. It was a strange figure, resembling someone Seto knew, but who he could not place. He stood tall and confidently, like perhaps a great king of old, a lord of a mighty empire, like Egypt or some grand medieval world filled with dungeons and dragons. Hey, that was a good idea. He resolved to write that one down later. I am the spirit whose coming was foretold to you. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. You're shorter than I expected. Look, do you want my help or not? Frankly, no. But it seems I have no choice. What brings you here, O oh spirit? Your welfare. <sighs> A night's unbroken rest may aid my welfare. Your influence, then. Rise and walk with me, Kaiba. It would have been in vain for Seto to have pleaded that the weather and the hour were unsuited to pedestrian purposes that the bed was warm and the temperature was below freezing, that he was clad but lightly in his nightclothes and deep sapphire dressing gown, and his blue dragon-shaped slippers. The spirit would not be resisted, a feeling he could not deny, and a thought that would undoubtedly spawn all kinds of meta and fan-fiction, and art that one saves in hidden folders, and looks at only when one is alone, in a dim, LCD-lit room for fear of judgment. So he rose, but upon finding that the spirit was leading him towards the window, he dragged his fashionably clad feet. I am mortal and liable to fall. But a touch of my hand there, and you shall fly. The spirit put his hands over the pyramid-shaped pendant around his neck, which began to glow, brighter and brighter, until it lit up the entire room. Seto did as instructed, and the spirit led him out of the second-story window, and it was with both relief and shock that Seto found his companion spoke the truth. For he did fly, over his own lawn and up towards the sky. From here he could see all of Domino, the great city dominated by the magisterial marvel that was Kyber Corp HQ. Seto clung to the spirit's hand as they flew through the night air. He scarcely knew where to look, at the stars above or the town below. But as he struggled to make up his mind, both disappeared, fading from view, until not a vestige of it all was to be seen. In its place, now another place, one all too familiar to the team. Good Gaia! I know where we are. I grew up here. If the metaphor about familiarity ringing bells had any literal merit, then Seto would have stood before a cathedral. But it was not a cathedral he faced. No, it was an orphanage. Your lip is trembling. And what is that upon your cheek? Mm, I have something in my eye. Yes tears. You recall the way? Recall? I could walk this place blindfolded. Seto made his way up the path, recognizing every sight around him, every cheerful child, every stern adult, every post and pillar and brick, and the window he came to, on the other side of which was a miserably decorated room, and two children seated either end of a table, and nearly one chess match between them. And how could he not recognize them? Seto's eyes beheld a sight that warmed him in ways he hadn't been warmed in what felt like forever. No, um, scratch that. That was only the sun peeking through the threadbare pergola that ran around the side of the building. No matter. It was a beautiful sight nonetheless. For the children were none other than Seto himself, and his little, littler than, brother. Seto had a sudden urge to burst into the room and speak to the boys. But as if reading his mind, the spirit intervened. These are but shadows, Kaiba. They have no consciousness of us. Check me. 
Sorry, Monkey. Looks like I win again. Wow, Seto. You're like the best chess player in the whole world. Nah, that isn't true. Oh, really? Name one person who's better than you. You! If you just concentrate. Let's set up and play again. At the time you thought your life unsurvivably arduous, did you not? And now here you are years later, longing for the days when it was just you and he. When being an orphan was the most of your worries. Not the least. Then something happened that, for all intents and purposes, should have made your life easier. Instead, it put it on the path to becoming what it is today. It was him. It was Goza Burokaiba. I was adopted. But not at Christmas. Oh, for the love of Ra. Will you just let the narrative do its job? He watched the fateful match unfold. He saw his younger self lay down the challenge, and observed as Gozabura ate it up like the fool he was. As he watched his former self make move after move, he noticed something new about the event that he'd never known about before. He watched his Mokuba, who then he'd had no time to notice, stand silently at his big brother's side, nervous but never wavering. He always did have an absurd amount of faith in him. Checkmate! You lose! Now you have to adopt us, just like you promised! You remember, of course. What happened next? The orphanage faded away, and in its stead, a much grander setting. The home of what was to remain of Seto's childhood. There was no chessboard, no decorations, not even meager ones. What is the matter? Nothing, nothing. It's only... My brother wanted to decorate my office for the holiday, and I told him no. I should like to have given him the chance, that's all. Let us see another Christmas. Around them now, Seto saw the thoroughfares of a city, where people scurried about their business, and though it was night time, the streets were brightly lit. It was apparent by the tinsel and the lights in all the windows that it was Christmas time here too. The spirit brought Seto to a stop before a certain warehouse door. Do you know this place? Know it? I was apprenticed here. They walked in below a large sign over the door. Industrial illusions, it said. And in the large space were brightly coloured ornaments strewn here and there. So the place was as beautifully adorned as one would expect from the man himself. And there he was. Without a doubt, Seta would know that white hair and red suit anywhere. <clears throat> um, no, uh, not that white hair and red suit. Why, it's old Pegasus. You there, Kaiba boy. And for a moment, Seto thought that perhaps the spirit had been wrong that the shadows of the past had no knowledge of them. But then, walking unknowingly right through his future self, came yet another version of Seto from long ago. There'll be no more work tonight. It's Christmas. Let's have off of the shutters. Not with the gorgonzola cheese and the world's finest wine. At the time, Industrial Illusions was well known for its magnificent Christmas parties. Extravagant was a word so commonly put to them, and Seto remembered them all. A wonderful way to end a stressful, work-filled year. The memories of these parties were some of the happiest that those in the room that had begun to fill up would ever retain. Seto watched the festivities. There was dancing, music and games, of course, and not a single wallflower, as even the most introverted of honoured guests were seduced into the hoopla. What a waste. What now? The links to which Pegasus went to please his employees and associates. He spent a couple hundred thousand of your earthly yen, and for what? A sorry waste that would have been better put back to business. If the spirit had said it about anybody else, Seto may have concurred. But these parties, he'd defend to his dying breath. He had the power to render us happy or unhappy. To make our work light or burdensome. He chose the former. And the happiness he gave us in these times is as great as any fortune he spent doing so. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is it? N nothing in particular. Nothing? Or something? No. No, it's just... I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. Come. My time grows short. The scene around him began anew as the pendant glowed once more, in another place and time. Only now... He sat with a beautiful young woman. She had bright eyes and soft blonde hair. And did Seto ever remember her well? Josephine, do not be unhappy. What else can I be in a stupid outfit like this? You seriously tell me all the good roles are taken? 
Just get on with it. Fine. Fine. <clears throat> what else can I be like this? W whatever do you mean? You used to be such a gentle soul, but business has corrupted you. I'm only trying to build a life for us. You like building a life I want, where I don't see you for days on end while you work. Where, when I do see you, you are so golden and different. I thought we would grow old together, but it only seems we grew apart. There was nothing Seto could say that would appease the woman. At length, she stood and walked away from the conversation, the last they would ever have. Spirit, no more. Take me home. I do not wish to see more. But against his pleading, the spirit insisted that there was one shadow left to see. The pyramid pendant again lit up, and they were in yet another place. Another time, yet another room. And there sat dear Josephine. In her chair by the fireplace, the door opened, and in stepped Josephine's new spouse, another beautiful blonde with long hair that sat in a neat ponytail. I saw an old friend of yours. Who was it, my darling? Guess. <laughs> How can I? Don't tell me. Was it Mr. Kaiba? Mr. Kaiba, indeed. His father is on the point of death, and yet there he sat, quite alone in the world, I do believe. It seems money is not enough to keep one company after all. S spirit take me away! I cannot bear this! How can you make me? This isn't of my doing, Kaiba. These are the shadows of your past. These are the events your choice has shaped. He didn't want to see that hellish pendant glow again. He didn't want to see another place, or time. He slipped off his robe, using it to smother the light from the triangular structure. In the struggle, if it could be called that, the spirit made no attempt to fight back. And so, once the light had been extinguished from the room, he disappeared. Seto fell, landing, lo and behold, in his very own bed. Exhausted and overcome, he closed his eyes and let sleep take him. All would be better in the morning. At least, that's what he told himself. Enter!